What's going on people? We are Tottenham TV here, back here with another Tottenham update video to bring to you today. Um, it's a bit of a short one, but let's get straight into it and let's get into the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium as it's been agreed with the Harangi Council that Tottenham will increase the stadium by 547 seats from 62,303 to 62,850. We just need fans in stadium. Yeah, now. <laughs> exactly. I must say, it's not. It's a bit of an odd time to do it. You know, it's a bit just strange considering no fans in the stadiums at the moment. So you're picking, you're picking this time to increase the capacity, but. I mean, I guess it's a good move for I mean, good move for Levy. I guess get more fans in the stadium. I'm sure we'll be happy about it. Gets us close to that 63,000 mark, and you know the Emirates wanted to increase by a few. It keeps us still ahead of them, <laughs> which is nice. But um, yeah, look, I mean, not much more to say about it. But I mean, it's, it's like the second or third time we've increased the yeah, capacity small already increases, since small increases. Uh, we opened it. Yeah, I wonder where they're going to put the seats. I wonder where like how, where they because look, look packed the brim like last time. They some you know I remember we for a friendly game we sat right behind the screen one time. Yeah. There's like a screen on the other side of the screen because it's actually, actually yeah. blocking a part of the pitch. In the north so, stand. Yeah. So I wonder where they can actually fit all these seats if they're increasing it. But I'm sure they'll find somewhere. It but, could also be in in the kind of hospitality areas. As yeah. well, you never know. Mm, true, um, but yeah, I guess the bigger the better, for especially from Levy's point of view. Just we need fans back in the stadium. And they're saying now not March the earliest. That's what I read the other day. Yeah. So it's just a bit of an odd time to do it. I feel, but all right, we need to own. What do you feel about fans in stadiums? Do you feel that the kind of because you can see fans in stadiums across the whole world? I don't know if you saw any of the French Open in tennis. There uh, were fans there. Were there? there were fans there and to cut, cut capacity. In America, they've got fans in stadiums. Um, what do you feel about it? Do you feel that it's time to let fans back in in a kind of safe way? I think they can do it because I think they've, first of all, they've shown um, in, in, in other countries they can do it safely. Uh, Dortmund had fans in stadiums the other day. Also, but also here in England, we've decided that in um, open air uh, like concerts and certain venues, you, uh, in outside uh, concerts you're allowed in, mm. but football you're not allowed in. I think football's kind of being treated in a different way. I kind of get it because... Do you think it's because of the reputation the fans have? I think so. I think it's exactly why. I think they don't want... Um, they, they don't want... Um, to let fans in stadiums all, all of a sudden like even if it's supposed to be socially distance and all of a sudden like someone gets a last minute winner and then there's like scenes in the crowd uh you know even if they're like getting together to celebrate it because they wouldn't be able to control themselves and that being that being broadcast live on tv uh they probably wouldn't be able they probably don't think they like the think the thought of that i think and how what kind of message that sends and also they probably don't also don't want a, a situation where they're punishing people for celebrating a last minute goal as well because football I get, I get I kind of get it because football's fans and how people celebrate football is different to how people go to a concert isn't it mm. because you can go to a concert and you can be a bit socially distanced and have a drink and uh, as you know even if it's like a concert you would usually go go crazy and mosh at you can kind of um, treat it in a different way because you've got they got all these gates and stuff around but football is a bit different it's hard it's a lot harder to police and a lot harder to get tell the fans look if the goal goes in can't like do well, good stuff well, the way do. the way it worked in in the French Open in France in for the tennis I know it's different tennis going to watch football but the way it worked in tennis was like there's like compartments where everyone sits in so so let's say there's com compartments of like two or three seats and they're all boarded off from everyone else so do you reckon they could do something similar to like that in football? Yeah, but the stadiums are bigger, aren't they? That's the problem. So there's a lot of compartments. Mm. There's a lot of effort to go through, and um, but, the, you money, know, the money it, will cost. Was well, it worth it? Mm. So maybe, maybe it would be. I don't know. I'm not the money man, but um, like, it's, I, it's just football. I think they could do it in a safe way. But I think that they're, they're probably worried about the message it would send. I think they're worried about repercussions of... Because um, football fans are especially... They're just a different breed, aren't they? The reputation precedes them. Especially in England, we like to drink. We like to go to the game, have a jolly good time. Yeah, but you know what? It's not no different to Germany. You know what I mean? They just as well like their drink over there and, you know, look at the the Dortmund yellow wall and stuff like that. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not exactly a different... But I guess the differences in Germany, maybe they're the... I don't, know, I don't know what the situation is. Maybe it's not as bad as it is here. Uh, maybe it's because of how I know right now the cases per day is like yes. almost as bad as it was yeah. back in lockdown. So I, don't know, so I don't know what it is in Germany. Maybe it's a lot safer. So they, they, they don't have that message, uh, that worried about the messages we are here. But at the moment, it's creeping up again. Not creeping up, it's 
pretty much back to where it was. So it's a worrying situation. They're probably worried about you know if they even if even if they do it in a social distance way and it goes wrong and people do start celebrating together in the in the stadium, they're worried about what the message that we send. Do you think obviously because there's been a few outbreaks with players now? I don't know if you saw Milan Skriniar got tested positive. Uh, a couple of your Liverpool players, didn't they? Yeah, West a couple Ham of Liverpool players. players, West Ham players. Kieran Tierney of Arsenal as well. He didn't. He wasn't positive, but he was around someone yeah. who was positive and had to isolate for two weeks. Do you think if this keeps on happening, they're going to have to put a stop to football in England? I hope not, but you know, look, if it gets if it gets too if the, ridic- if the situation gets to too ridiculous, then uh, you, we might have to at some point. I really hope they don't stop it again because um, I think it'll be it'll be such a blow. I think everyone's enjoying it at the moment. Uh, the, uh, the the Premier League being back, and I think if everyone goes back into lockdown and football stops, it will just be I just be sad. I think I really obviously don't want it, but you know what? It might have to be a situation where we they do. But I don't know. We we'll have to see. I have to see. It's gonna. It's difficult to say at the moment. Um, I, I don't know if we're gonna go as tough lockdown as we were back in March. So I don't know if we will. Because uh, I think we know more about the virus now. We know more how to subjugate uh, the the effects of it in terms of spreading it. So I think football should should carry on. I don't think we will. But you never know. If it gets that bad, we might have to. All right. Let's move on. And there has been some groundbreaking news that are coming out over the weekend talking about the restructuring of the Premier League uh, the hierarchy of Liverpool and the hierarchy of Man U put this plan together proposal um, pr- pr- proposal to the Premier League um, it's called Project Big Picture which really looks like it's going to restructure the Premier League if it does go ahead um, is there what can you tell me about it Sim? yeah it's a really radical proposal um, put ahead by these uh, by the clubs and it's actually been backed publicly by the EFL chairman Rick Parry who used to be I think the chairman of Liverpool yeah. or used to be director of Liverpool or something yeah he was on the board there yeah so he's now the chairman of um, the EFL and he's given his public backing um, so how it works is the Premier League will be reduced to 18 clubs from 20 clubs um, in terms of how relegation promotion would work um, position number 18 and 17 will be automatically relegated as long as and as well as the top two teams in the championship will be promoted team number 16 whoever finished 16th in the premier league will go into a playoff with third fourth and fifth in the, the championship yeah the championship playoff yeah so they're going to the championship playoff which basically. is also very similar to the way it works in some european germany leagues does as well that, germany, germany definitely um the talk also this would involve scrapping the efl cup and scrapping the community shield although the efl cup they're saying might survive but they're just the teams in europe will be pulled out of it and it'll just be a, a competition with everyone else everyone else to, to play for um this also includes the end of the democratic voting for um the premier league which is usually one club one vote uh how this is that that's how they usually pass uh, motions to change um for major changes to the premier league but this would uh, give special power is to the nine longest serving teams in the Premier League, which is the top six, include and West Ham, Everton, so and Southampton. So the Man Southampton. City fall in that? Uh, yeah, because they've been in the Premier League since for, for a long time. It's, uh, Southampton are, are, are um, got to the Premier League in 2012, and they're the ninth longest serving. Right. So, uh, so anyone else before that would uh, would be. But it's actually interesting. Apart from Southampton, no one's been in the Premier League a lot since 2012, like consistently. Uh, so the 11 teams it shows how much change there are there used to be a lot more teams consistently in there but not anymore a lot more yo-yo clubs now um so yeah so the top six and the um plus uh, west ham uh everton Southampton will have uh decision making powers on on premier league uh, teams and only six of the nine teams will have will have to agree um to motion for them to pass which means the top six gives it the top six teams incredible amount of power absolutely incredible um and it also they'll get also gives them power to veto um even um ownership changes if a new owner wants to take over a club the, the big six would have a power to veto it which is quite a lot of power if i say so myself i must say it really this really seems like a power grab by the big six i must say so let's say if if this newcastle takeover was starting now yeah the rest of the t- the top nine clubs in the premier league or the longest serving can in actually theory, veto that in theory that's mental in theory they would have to do it under grounds of you know something reasonable but in theory they would have the power to veto the, the ownership uh, of a of a of a, t- a takeover i mean uh, uh veto uh, included in in this um restructure i mean every season um 25 percent 
of the Premier League revenue would go to the EFL clubs would drop down so to support That's them a good thing. and also the, it's included including this is a hundred million pound gift to the EFL on top of that um, to help uh, clubs who are in trouble um, to, uh, so yeah sorry two, yeah, 250 million immediate compensation for the EFL as well plus 25% of future uh, Premier League revenue um, I thought there was a hundred million gift to the Premier League no no to the EFL oh, to hundred the million EFL. to the EFL um, but yeah, so that's that's basically how that that's basically the main points of it. And obviously, the Carabao Cup and the Community Shield looking to be scrapped. That's as what well. I said. Oh, yeah, yeah, I said that. Yeah, but them said the EFL Cup could survive, but the Community Shield it should be scrapped. Arsenal win every time, so like, it just shows <laughs> what friendly it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, I look. Will it benefit Spurs massively? Yes, hundred percent. That's a, obviously with one eye, with one eye on that. I'm like, ooh, nice, but. If we're being honest, is a ma- this is just a massive power grab by the tip, the top six. In all honesty, like this is just a um, the top six looking to literally exploit a situation at the moment where the EFL was so desperate for support. They're trying they're trying to restructure things in their favour. And written from what Rick Parry said, he said, "Does this does this benefit the top six massively?" He said, "Yes, but is it good? But is it for the good of the football league?" He said, "Yes, that's why we should do it. Uh, that's why he's in favour of it because he thinks he's saying that the football league is in such a die straight at the moment like what what we do you can just we're we just gonna let these football clubs wither away even if the top six do benefits for the good of the game that's what i need to do but it's faced major opposition from obviously the rest of the premier league who yes. the premier league itself um yesterday released a statement in opposition of, of the motion for me it feels like it benefits the top nine like massively as well as the EFL and like championship below, but then the bottom ten in the Premier League mm-hmm. seems to get screwed big time. A on bit this. looks like at the moment they don't have any power. I, it's a bit weird one because I don't know what happens if West Ham, Southampton, or any of the teams who are in the top nine get relegated. I don't know if that, do they lose their power. I, I'm not 100 percent sure uh, how that works. Um, no and apparently, really said that. apparently they're talking about the parachute payments for teams that get relegated. That's going to be completely cancelled. Yeah, they'll be stopped in favour of the 25 yeah. percent if. Uh, Premier League revenue going to EFL teams. So um, I mean, as a as a football fan, take your Spurs hat off for a second. Do yeah. you think that this should be going ahead? No, no, and I'll be absolutely livid if I was a, a team of uh, oh in, in the Premier League who wasn't one of the big nine. But uh, again, do you expect a team in the bottom ten? I mean, the top six, let's say top six, top seven, have ultimately all the power anyway. Why financial power? No, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. Um, I think in terms of... I mean, it's very, very hard to, to, to kind of bridge that gap between... Leicester have done it last season. Yeah, Leicester have done it. Everton looked to breach the gap this season. I th- Look, obviously it's difficult. It happens, no but it's rare. No doubt about it. Yeah, look, no doubt about it. It's, it's difficult, but I think... All the, all, uh, you know, before before the obviously the whole pandemic pandemic hit anyway, all the clubs were spending money. All the clubs were signing players, and every, everyone seemed to have loads of money. Uh, you know, you got uh, you had like Bournemouth signing people for thirty million, like yeah. you know, you know, Sheffield United spending like twenty million on early Bernie things like that. Uh, everyone was splashing the cash. I don't think it was like it was a fact of the matter. Like only the top six had money to spend, and no one else did. So um, I don't think that that's necessarily true. And also with with the one club one vote system. It, the, the the kind of for the regulations all the power was kind of spread evenly between all 20 Premier League clubs now it's kind of you only need six uh, you, you before you needed 14 of 20 teams to, to agree to something to pass, pass a motion now you only have six or nine and, is, is that and what, that's the top six is that what uh, if the top pro- six agree on Project something, Big Picture needs does it need 14 clubs to pass it yes Top the yeah, to, to pass the motion. I think they need fourteen. Do you think of, they'll get it? I, I can't see them getting it. Look, the only look, Rick Parry agreed to it, but it's going to be very difficult. I mean, I can see the top nine clubs, the nine clubs that they're talking about, of course they are. going they, for it. But then after that, I can't see any other clubs accepting that. Can you? So I, I can't see it, but I don't know. I don't know what the what, what the what's in it for them, or maybe I don't know. Maybe there's maybe there are clubs near the bottom of the Premier League thinking well. This could secure us if we, even if we get get relegated, at That's least we know we're thing, secure. Like, like a team like a Fulham, who look like they could be going down this they, season, they could be thinking, look, even, this could be good for us because even if we get relegated, we'll still be secure. So, it should, even, so even if we give a bit more power to the top six, but it's although okay. if the, if the laws stay the same, they still get their parachute payments. Yeah, yeah, it's also true. So I, it's, it's it's a difficult one. I don't look. I don't think it's, I don't think they'll it'll pass the Premier League. Are, I know the Premier League itself are in big opposition to it. Uh, but and but I guess we have to wait and see. It um, doesn't sit right with me at all. This whole thing. 
Um, doesn't seem right to me that all this, that the top six can agree agree on something and that's it. It's passed and uh, it, whatever it is, we don't know what they're gonna what they're gonna pass in their in their um, advantage. So um, it gives a lot of power to them. But you know, when you look at Rick Parry, who's the EFL chairman, he's saying this is for the good of the game or for the good of the EFL. I don't know. Maybe he's right. Uh, it's, it's difficult to know, really. But uh, yeah. All right. Well, you let me know in the comment section below. What do you think about Project Big Picture? Do you think um, it's something that should be passed, or do you think that it's just something to help the bigger teams um, and it's a bit unfair? Let me know in the comment section below. But now let's talk uh, back again about Milan Skriniar, because <laughs> Alistair Gold has come out and said that. He will be very surprised if Tottenham do not reignite their interest in January. Uh, what do you make out of that, Sim? Yeah, I, I expected that to be honest. He said it's very likely that Tottenham will that will go back in for Skriniar in January and we'll look at the situation. Um, I think that's absolutely no surprise considering as well. Um, he was reportedly at, at the end of last season out of favour and they were very willing to do a deal this summer because they wanted they would rather other targets. And obviously we couldn't get a deal done for the right price in summer. Inter Milan asking for. 50 million we only wanted to pay 30 million um but if if you know if they go for another six months with him being out of favor and him um not being the right center back for their system then maybe the price is going to come down in january because they could see that situation and, and think oh, it's just best to get rid we can't do another six months of this maybe they'll feel like that we'll have to see what the situation is maybe he'll be maybe he'll be starting every game and be a star for them and they'll and they won't uh they won't entertain any offers but i think if the situation is similar in january I can see us going for sure going back in for him, 100%. And yeah, I think everyone knows how much we need it. Well, it's not how much we need a centre back, but that that's the kind of last hole in our squad, uh, kind of that we do need. Um, in terms of another Inter Milan player, Christian Eriksen, it's been coming out over the last couple of days. I don't know how true it is, but he's been calling out Antonio Conte for not many starts. Um, and also it was kind of believed that we were interested in taking him back on loan in the transfer window. Do you think there was any truth in that? No, I don't think there was any truth in that. I, was, I think that was just rubbish from the tabloids. I don't, think, I don't think it was us being interested. I think if anything, it was Inter Milan offering him and we, us probably saying no. Um, I mean, Romano did say that we um, made a contact with Inter Milan. Yeah, we probably did. For, 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 in, for Ericsson on loan. We did ask the question, apparently. Maybe it's true. I I, th I reckon I don't think it is. I think it's more likely that Inter probably offered it to us because they don't think he's right for the for, for the system. I don't think we, I can't see why we'd have inquired for him where we've got all these players. Maybe if we let it go, Delhi, I can see that. Um, but if we still had Delhi on board, like, like it's not really a, a position for him at the moment in the squad. We have too many players, so I can't mm. see that being true. Um, but well, look, I, th I, I, you know, my position on Ericsson. I, th I love Ericsson. I think he's such one of the best playmakers in Europe when he's at his, at his best. And I think he, I think, I think he's realising he probably rushed too far, too much into this move to Inter Milan. And I reckon if he would have waited, he, if he would have gone on a free, he might have got a better deal somewhere else. But he decided to rush out the club, and that's that. But it's probably better for us because we got money and didn't let him go on a free. Um, but Ericsson, yeah, he's having a tough time of it at the moment. He's not playing a lot. Um, he's he's really struggling to get a position. I think this the whole Conte system doesn't really allow for him hit that kind of player. Um, you know, because under when he played for Chelsea, when he was at Chelsea, Conte he played a three four three system where you got two wingers, two wing backs, three centre backs. Like there's not really a position for mm. a uh, number ten like Ericsson in that position. You need everyone to in that position to be like very physical, um, and you can't really. Uh, carry any passages off the ball so whether he's I, I can see I can see why he's struggling with that to be honest Ericsson and I can see him maybe getting a move somewhere maybe in January or in the summer but would I take him back if he honestly if he's if he really wants to come back and, and he's willing to put in his best then yeah I would but I just don't think that's I think that situation's been and gone now and I don't, I don't think it would be the same if he ever came back for me, that ship sailed now. I think we've moved on. We've got players Tongu and Dombele, Giovanni, Lo Celso. Um, you're, all, you're already talking about Deli Ali not being able to fit in the system we're playing. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ericsson might struggle to fit into the system we're I playing agree. now as well. So, I agree. Uh, for me, I think once you down tools, it's very hard to get it back. So, I mean, for me, Ericsson's a no. Um, obviously, I loved him when he was at Spurs, and I think he was completely imperative to everything that we were doing in our attacking motions and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's a no from me. I think uh, that ship's sailed for me. 
But look, let's move on. Uh, last bit of the video, we're gonna be talking about the internationals, the international update. Um, let's start off with France against Portugal. That finished nil-nil. Hugo Lloris playing 90 minutes, captaining France. Nice clean um, sheet. Nice clean sheet, and he made a really nice save in the last minute as well. And also, there was a really interesting quote from Antoine Griezmann um, over the international break. He was talking about um, Lloris as captain. He was asked, uh, what, uh, what, how is he as a captain? And um, he said, he's like... he doesn't say that much and he's not he leads by example but when he speaks the whole dressing room is silent that's what he said and that's what you kind of saw in the documentary 100%. is why everyone listens to every word he says and when he speaks he speaks with authority mm -hmm. and he speaks to someone like you should be listening to him yeah and he has that kind of captain's authority so it's just interesting that he has that with France as well that even big players like Mbappe and Pogba and they all they all listen to him and listen to what he has to say yeah, no, I 100% agree with that. Let's move on to the England game. England beat Belgium 2-1. In the build-up to this England game, Harry Kane, uh, there was a bit of a question mark whether he was fit or not. Yeah, um, oh man, Southgate. It was very, very scary. Southgate came out with that it was muscle fatigue. I um, mean, it also came out that Tottenham were trying to get him back off international break and Southgate wouldn't release him. Um, but look, it ended up, the game finished 2-1 to England. Eric Dyer played 90 minutes. Toby played 90 minutes. And Harry Kane came on for the last 25 minutes for yeah. Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Should have scored as well. Free header inside the box and he yeah. played wide from a corner. Uh, but yeah, I have to say, um, watching the England game, Eric Dyer, I know he actually played quite well throughout the game, but the penalty he gave by was absolutely diabolical. Shocking. What a shocking penalty. No Such pun intended. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, exactly. But what an awful, awful challenge that was in Lukaku. Lukaku was going absolutely nowhere. He was on the right-hand side of the box and he's on, he's on his right foot and he just dives in, doesn't get anywhere near the ball. No way, brings near him down, the ball. Like ridiculous, ridiculous challenge. And I even, you know, while I was watching, I just had my head in my hands like, oh my God, this is our starting. It was back. Eric Eric Dyer channeling his just, inner Eric he, Dyer. He just has these moments, man. And it's so frustrating and and it's so annoying that you know he had that chance for England to establish himself, um, you know, as a partner for Maguire in in the centre back positions, and he puts in a challenge like that, and it always and it just puts in put to the, the doubts creep back in. And it's like. And someone put a tweet out, I was like, for a centre, ever since he's moved to centre back, he's given away a lot of penalties. And you think about it, like, I know the Newcastle one wasn't really at all, but, you know, he gave away one against Man United, um, against Pogba, he's given one now against Lukaku, he did give one and one against Newcastle. So it's a few penalties he's given away. It's, it's, it's a bit worrying from that, from that point of view. It is worrying, and it just seems as though he is clumsy, um, and yeah. could be a mistake waiting to happen. I mean, he really needs to up his concentration levels and decision making. Yeah, I was so disappointed when he gave away that penalty. I really was so disappointed. But look, I think I do think he's been our best centre back this season mm. uh, so far. So you've got to give him his props on that. But he does need to up his concentration levels. I think that's the main thing. Uh, but that's the England game. Let's move on to the Wales Ireland game. Another Nations League finished nil nil. Ben Davis and uh, Matt Doherty both playing ninety minutes, and I believe Matt Doherty actually played centre back because because um, they got a last minute injury. Yeah, they got an injury in the game. I think during the game. So I think it was early on. Kevin Long went off and Doherty moved to centre back. So I don't know who plays up front for Wales, but it probably would. Give them, <laughs> it doesn't sound like it gave him the toughest of rides. Um, but yeah, I think Mike Doherty's played that role a few times centre-back. He's not really that natural to him, but he can do it. And obviously we know Davis as well can play centre-back as well. So I guess we have a few options if we really need, if we're desperate and we have a few injuries, they can kind of fill in there. But um, yeah, well, f fair play to Doherty for keeping a clean sheet. All right. And last but not least, Iceland, it's Iceland nil, Denmark 3. Pierre-Emil Hoybier playing 90 minutes grabbing an assist for Christian Eriksen goal as well um, and apparently I was reading up on the game I didn't see much of it but I was reading up on it and apparently Hoybier played very very well uh, they gave him like a 7.7 .7 rating that's good uh, I saw the assist he made it was kind of like uh, it was it was a interception slash assist he kind of some I think an Iceland player went for a shot from like 30 yards and he kind of blocked it and um, um, blocks it with, like, with the side of his foot and it kind of fell to Ericsson who kind of ran through, through in on goal and scored. So he assisted Ericsson there. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad for him. Hopefully he's playing with more confidence. Hopefully they don't burn him out and play him against England, but they probably will. Um, but yeah, I think Hoybier uh, continues his good start to the season. 
All right, so there you have it. That is the Tottenham update for today. We spoke about the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium getting in a capacity increase. That Milan screening our links that do not go away. Project Big Picture, we have given you our thoughts on that. And the international roundup so far yet with international break. There are more games happening this week, so we'll be giving you updates as and when those happen. Let me know in the comment section below any thoughts you have regarding anything we spoke about today. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come, come on, on you Spurs. Spurs. Yeah!